Welcome to another uh, special episode of Orinoco Tribune and this one will be on IT and whatever is happening in IT and with us we have today uh, an authority on IT and issues as I call him, it's Kim Ives and he is a journalist, a documentary maker and he is the founder of the weekly newspaper IT Liberty which we uh, at Orinoco Tribune follow a lot so there he is a writer and an editor and previously, he wrote, edited, and photographed for IT Progress for 23 years. He has also written for numerous other publications, such as The Guardian, The Nation, The Intercept, The Progressive, Jacobin, and Nuclear Report on the Americas. And he's also a well-known filmmaker, and some of his uh, documentaries include Bitter Kane, uh, ICN Leve Kanpe, and I, I'm sure I butchered the name, the coup oh, continues, one. killing the dream, and a resistance. His most recent work is the documentary series Another Vision Inside IT is Uprising, jointly directed with Dan Cohen, who was here before also, like in this show. And Kim is a member of Crowing Rooster Arts, a film collective specializing in films on Haiti. He is a founding member of the International Support IT Network, formerly the IT Support Network, and has led numerous delegations to Haiti since 1986 to investigate human rights violations, union struggles, peasant land conflicts, and state enterprise privatization campaigns. And Kim Ives is a frequent guest on different radio and television networks and shows, including Al Jazeera, Democracy Now!, RTTV, CCTV, America, National Public Radio, The Hill, The Real News Network, Turkish TV and the Radio Sputniks, The Critical Hour and Political Misfits and several Pacifica Network and Progressive Radio Network programs. Uh, thanks a lot, Kim, for uh, accepting the invitation. So we are today going to talk about whatever is happening in the country. Like it's a small country, but a lot is happening and nobody talks about it. So thanks a lot for coming. Well, thank you very much. Sahil. So we'll start right away. So recently, like in a your newspaper, we have read about the uh, Haitian citizen self-defense movement. It started in Port-au-Prince and it's called Boakale. So what is this movement about and how did it begin and what are its objectives? Well, the movement began on, uh, on April 24th of this year. There was a uh, busload of uh, young men with guns who was stopped at a police checkpoint in an area of Port-au-Prince called Canapé Vert. And um, the police discovered the weapons. Uh, they were on their way to reinforce uh, a gang which was uh, in some sort of military confrontation uh, further away up the hill uh, from Port-au-Prince. And uh, they were taken into the police station, but the night before, the population of Canapé Vert had been terrorized, essentially by shooting of gangs, uh, you know, firing, some sort of battle was going on. And so they were very keyed up, and they basically demanded the police remove these guys from the police station. They put them in the middle of the street, they piled tires on them, they stoned them, killed them, sometimes with machetes mostly, and uh, then they burned their bodies. And this horrific scene uh, was really to send a message to the gangs who have been terrorizing the Haitian people for the last five years, we can even say 10, um, to say that th they were not going to accept it anymore. I should say that it came on the heels of the killing of another gang leader up in the areas of uh, La Boule and Thomasin, which is in the mountains above Port-au-Prince. Uh, he was basically tracked down by the police and uh, killed. So uh, there was some sort of psychological um, tipping point that happened, and the population said, we are going to take the offensive. And as you may know, it is often a question of psychological 
uh, um, balance that determines who's on the offensive. And uh, the gangs have had the psychological advantage over the years. Uh, the, the terror has been uh, uh, wielded by them. And now the people uh, with their machetes uh, accompanying the police have turned the tables on the gangs. So, um, and these are, are criminal gangs who basically have uh, conducted a lot of kidnapping um, of often very poor people uh, who might have relatives in the diaspora who can cough up some money um, rape of young women, uh, extortion of small merchants, and uh, the, the, the population is just fed up. And uh, so this is really um, an extension of what happens in the Haitian countryside. Historically, over the years, the police have been very weak. And many times, if uh, some sort of uh, criminals end up in a neighborhood, the population mobilizes, uh, gathers their machetes, and they do what's called expedited justice, and they, they just kill them. And that's a little bit what's happening now in the cities of Port-au-Prince, uh, of, of, of Haiti. So it's not just Port-au-Prince, but other cities also? Other cities as well, yes. It's happened in Cape Haitian, uh, Okai, uh, Gonaive, Jacmel, uh, and... Um, in some parts of the countryside as well. Okay, so you mentioned gangs, and this is the thing that everybody mentions about Haiti. Like, the first thing that one hears is, like, I mean, the first thing that comes to one's mind would be gangs. So, in fact, in this case also, you already mentioned that there were gang violence within the city, like the capital city, for years. So, in, in, in this case, like, just before the start of this movement, there was a reports of increase in gang wars of control over territory. So do you think that this situation involving the gang violence and the anti-gang resistance would be used as a pretext by the United States and Canada to start uh, another invasion of Haiti for which I mean they, are, they have been preparing for years? Yes. Well, you know, they always have to find some sort of watchword, catchphrase to mobilize uh, public opinion. We remember back in the days of the um, invasions of the Horn of Africa, Somalia or, or Ethiopia, uh, it was warlords, you know, the warlords are, go so they, they, they come up with these sort of phrases. So now for Haiti, it's the gangs, it's all gangs. They're just sort of uh, wanton lawless young men and women who are just have no morals, no principles. So this is the picture they're trying to portray uh, the Haitian people, uh, which is untrue. And as um, uh, it is true that the Haitian national police has been greatly debilitated by the fact that over the past 30 years, there have been two US led foreign military interventions into Haiti, one in 1994 and the second in 2004. And uh, both of these uh, were followed uh, by occupations, military occupations, which basically uh, underdeveloped the police. And it's a force of about 13,000 uh, troops, uh, uh, officers, 13,500. This for a country of 12 million people. So it's smaller than the U New York City police force um, uh, with a budget uh, much smaller, uh, about half. And you, you have uh, these burgeoning slums, which have come from the neoliberal crushing of the Haitian rural economy. The peasants, due to the dumping of uh, U.S. goods primarily on the country. Uh, the countryside has emptied of its peasantry uh, and they end up in the cities in these vast, vast slums. This is not something unique to Haiti, of course. You see it uh, throughout the third world. And uh, so you have this giant lumpen proletariat, which is 
just seeking to survive day to day, hawking uh, uh, sugar water on the streets or you know, resorting to crime of some form or another. And um, uh, this is uh, something which has plagued neighborhoods. And uh, so there has emerged a sort of a counter force. Uh, you could call there, they've been called originally after the Duvalier regime fell and the Tonto Makuts, his paramilitary force were uh, wreaking havoc. They were called vigilance brigades that, that fought against these criminals. Uh, now they've been, come also to be called Comité de Quartier, uh, uh, um, neighborhood committees, armed neighborhood committees. So there's a big difference. Yes, they're both armed, but some are uh, fighting the criminals. They're driving out the criminals from their neighborhood. And as I uh, said to the UN Security Council, you're taking the good guys and the bad guys and lumping them all in one basket called the gangs. So this is uh, precisely the problem, Saheli. The, the two um, sides are being morphed into one character, which is used in the US narrative uh, and Canadian and French, I should say, uh, to justify the foreign military intervention that they're seeking. Okay, so in your uh, that um, documentary series, another vision which we watched already. So in that series, the person who appears like who would be the protagonist is the group G9 and its leader Jimmy Sharisier. So is his organization or his he himself? So do they have any sort of relation or involvement with this ongoing Boakale movement? Yes, indeed. Um, in many ways, he was the forerunner, the precursor of the Barcale, because he was a cop, a stellar cop, as we show in the film, who was fighting the gangs. And uh, the police essentially hung him out to dry after a botched operation and uh, began to use him as their scapegoat or uh, as their target because he began to organize these neighborhood committees, not just for self-defense, but really to create a revolution in Haiti to overthrow the bourgeoisie, which fuels a lot of these gangs. They use these gangs uh, to carry out their inter-bourgeois battles or to keep the people at bay. So um, he said, this is a corrupt, system. These people are using us uh, to uh, fight their political battles, and we don't want to be their cannon fodder anymore. So Jimmy Sherry's yay became a big threat to the system. Um, and, you know, so they've, they've targeted his movement um, and cast him as the, uh, the, the, the Osama bin Laden, if you will, of uh, 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 Haiti. The, the guy who's responsible for all the problems. And um, when he is simply a response, he is simply uh, the, the popular response. And as again, I said at the United Nations, this is, this is the essence of self-determination. It's, it's community self-defense. And um, so the, the gangs uh, in, in, uh, are, um, one of the monikers and the other is uh, Jimmy Charitier in the G9. But uh, this is a, um, in our mind, a potentially revolutionary movement. So, but the question that everyone would ask is why, what does Haiti have that the US, Canada, France would want? Like it's, the image of Haiti is like millions of impoverished people. So what does the country have that the US would want or Canada or any, anybody else in the, like any imperial power would want? Well, the first thing one has to realize is Haiti is in the middle of the Caribbean, the Haiti's, uh, the US backyard, they used to say, now Biden has said it's our front yard, uh, which is um, the belt that goes across the middle of it. If anybody looks at the map, you'll see Cuba to the west, in the center, you have the island of Hispaniola, which is divided between 
Haiti on the west and the Dominican Republic on the east and then Puerto Rico. So these three islands um, have been, uh, and four nations have been uh, the target of US imperialism uh, really for the past two centuries. Uh, and uh, the Windward Passage, which goes between Haiti and Cuba is the route through which all the ports, all the, all the um, uh, boats and tankers uh, leaving the ports of the uh, East Coast have to go through the Panama Canal to get to the Pacific and, and to California. So uh, strategically, that's very important. Um, the second thing to realize is that Haiti is one of the, I think it's now 12 countries who recognize Taiwan as, Haiti, as the China of the world. And um, it uh, plays a very important role in uh, the US, the coming US war with China, uh, I believe, um, in that it uh, can be a sort of a a hood ornament on the tank of uh, US military uh, aggression against China. And um, in this sense, uh, you know, they used Haiti in their campaign against Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. Uh, we're using uh, Jovenel Moise, who we can talk about later, the assassinated president for, for a period. Uh, but uh, furthermore, uh, they are going to need Haiti's cheap labor. Haiti is the cheapest labor in the Western Hemisphere, about five bucks a day, $4.70 a day, a day uh, that a Haitian assembly worker is paid to make the electronics and underwear and the clothing for uh, the US market. So the US needs this, uh, uh, I could say floating or not floating, but island, a uh, prison uh, camp uh, factory that uh, Haiti uh, can become. It has already started. It has three large industrial parks on it. And so to secure this, the US has launched a thing called the Global Fragility Act, which is um, uh, essentially where they would set up a military base in Haiti uh, supposedly to help with the humanitarian crisis. And if you listen to the UN speeches, it's always hideous humanitarian catastrophe. So they're trying to put in US troops there. They just did this, by the way, in another country where they're trying to put the GFA called, uh, it, which is Papua New Guinea. Uh, uh, and this is uh, another one of the targets. So they, they've got five countries who are their principal targets uh, to make the front line against uh, China, uh, the, the war with China. It's not that China's aggressing, it's that they're aggressing. Um, the uh, Haiti, Papua New Guinea, Mozambique, Libya, and then uh, the West Africa, the countries of uh, West Africa, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, etc. cetera. So, um, so this is another reason why they're trying to get Haiti, which is going to be a pawn in this war with China. Another thing is there's a revolutionary movement, as I mentioned, which is occurring in Haiti or, or, or starting to bud in Haiti. And this is a danger, especially because it can easily spread right next door across the 231 mile border with the Dominican Republic, which itself is uh, experiencing a lot of the um, uh, uh, symptoms of the decline of the US empire. Uh, less tourism, more extraction. Uh, the Dominican Republic has uh, in many ways become the place where all the uh, companies that fled revolutionary Cuba back in 1959, 1960, they ended up in Dominican Republic. And so if the contagion, if the revolutionary contagion spreads to Dominican Republic, that's a very big problem. And lastly, I'll say uh, Haiti does 
have in Dominican Republic too, the island of Hispaniola Genera, have a lot of very important minerals. It's mostly mountainous. Uh, iridium, very key in uh, the building of the new uh, digital age. Uh, it's a uh, mineral which is um, essential for computer chips and so forth. A uh, gold, Haiti is said to have some $200 billion worth of gold dust in its mountains. Uh, I mean, Columbus and uh, the Spaniards got most of the rich veins, but there's a lot of gold dust in the mountains. But this requires basically blowing off the mountaintops, sluicing them with cyanide, and you destroy the water table and make uh, ecological dis uh, catastrophe. So uh, this is uh, very uh, problematic. Uh, it said, some say that Haiti has oil. It may be true. Mineral, uh, uh, the, the, the topography suggests it. And I know that over the years, there have been many, many uh, explorations for oil, and they may be keeping it under wraps. And uh, lastly, of course, is the cheap labor pool that Haiti provides 12 million people who are uh, ready to work for five bucks a day. So these are all the reasons why the US uh, it has interests in Haiti. So those, I mean, natural resources are always a thing when it comes to colonialism. So like it's the basis and of course, cheap labor, like you say. So that's gold and iridium and lithium. These are the things that one would hear of the countries of South America, but generally not about Haiti. But yeah, that makes sense that the Hawaii dude want to control that country apart from every other thing. Uh, anyway, so I, what I'm going to ask now is about how can Haitians who are like poor people, impoverished people, how can they have guns? I don't think Haiti itself is a manufacturer of weapons. Well, no, it is not. But Haiti is only 600 miles from Florida, uh, from South Florida is the principal source of the guns that flow into Haiti. I mean, uh, uh, I can say the source in that they go not just to Haiti, but they go to the Dominican Republic and then they flow across this very porous border with the Dominican Republic. But also the Haitian coastline is um, very unpatrolled, uh, uh, very unguarded. Uh, it's... Um, I mean, you try to come into the U.S. coastline, if you're not uh, declared in some way, you're going to have a Coast Guard boat on you in a matter of seconds. Uh, in the case of the Haitian border, there, there's no such thing. I think the Coast Guard is maybe three or four Boston whalers. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very small force and is negligible. So it's very easy with fast boats primarily to uh, uh, they, they bring in drugs from the south. Uh, and from the north, uh, you have a lot of tankers, um, not tankers, but cargo boats, uh, usually kind of jalopies, if you will, which um, uh, basically load up in the Miami River. Uh, and, uh, they, you know, they're filled with things like clothing and cars filled with uh, boxes of uh, um, uh, canned beans and whatever else, but hidden in them are lots of guns often, you know, guns which end up going on to the black market in Haiti. And so Haiti is basically awash in these guns, which, and, and, and China and Russia have said this to the U.S. at the Security Council. They said, you're complaining about all the guns in Haiti. Well, you're the one sending the guns there. It's all your your uh, uh, gun dealers in primarily Florida uh, who are uh, selling guns to people who are then smuggling them into Haiti. So you crack down on that there. And of course, the, the U.S. will occasionally do what they call in Creole grimace, uh, which is kind of a, you know, a foot shuffle, a, a, a head faint, if you will, to say um, that, you know, we're going to crack down and they'll, they'll bust some boat on the Miami, Miami River, and that's the end of it. Things go back to normal. But basically, most of the guns, the, 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 the simple answer is most of the guns are fl flowing into Haiti from South Florida, uh, where uh, 
the U.S. gun manufacturers send a lot of their wares. And uh, you'd think that the U.S. government is only like complicit in the sense that it does not do anything to stop it or it wants the guns to go into Haiti? No. Um, you mean the U.S. government? Yeah, or, or any other U.S. authorities like border authorities or anything. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, sometimes they do. Like, you have to realize in the early 2000s, when Jean-Bertrand Aristide, a nationalist president, was uh, in power, the U.S. was uh, fomenting uh, all sorts of mischief and uh, skullduggery across the border from the Dominican Republic where the so-called rebels, a kind of a contra force headed by a guy called Guy Philippe uh, had their base and they were sending across guns. Uh, okay, this was 19 years ago, but still uh, 20 years ago, but a lot of those guns are still circulating in Haiti. Um, and so yes, the US encouraged it. After that, uh, after the, the coup against Aristide in, on February 29th, 2004, uh, the U.S., you know, clamped down on it and said, no, you know, we're going to stop all the, um, uh, we're going to put an embargo on weapons going to Haiti. So officially, they were opposed to weapons going into Haiti. But uh, when they need to overthrow a government, they, they turned a blind eye and let it go in. So, um, and of course, this is good business for the U.S. gun manufacturers, uh, 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 Remington and uh, you know, all the all the gun manufacturers are, are, are very happy to see a market uh, in in the Caribbean where uh, their their weapons can go. Like they have many markets in that region, but yeah, yeah. like Colombia is a big market. Mexico is a market. There is right. like the government of Mexico even has a case against them, the manufacturers. Yeah. But I believe that the case should also be against the U.S. authorities at least. Yeah. But anyway. So, and apart from guns, there is another scourge that IT has been suffering for decades, which is cholera. So recently there is also like, again, the reports of epidemics of cholera in different parts of Port-au-Prince, I think, and also in other cities. And like in the midst of all these gangs and guns and violence, et cetera, this thing gets mentioned even less. So what is the situation of the epidemic? Like, are people, getting any sort of health care, any help amid this crisis? Okay. Well, uh, first to mention Haiti never had cholera up until 2010, and uh, it was due to the uh, UN military occupation of Haiti that it uh, acquired cholera through Nepalese troops who had gone back to Nepal uh, on holiday. Uh, they brought back with them uh, cholera. There was a cholera uh, outbreak in Nepal at the time. And their outhouses uh, basically leaked in the headwaters of the Artibonite River, the largest river in Haiti. And uh, it flows into Haiti's rice basket, uh, the Artibonite Valley. And uh, from there, it spread to the entire country. And as uh, your listeners and viewers may know, uh, cholera is essentially spread uh, when feces comes in contact with drinking water. It's um, uh, a, a bacteria which is uh, spread in that manner. And in uh, Haiti, this is a big problem. This, <laughs> during, again, the uh, coup uh, against uh, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, the second coup against Jean-Bertrand Aristide from uh, 2001, when he came into power till 2004, they cut off uh, International Development Bank. Uh, I think it was a $158 million uh, project to improve Haitian sanitation. And uh, the U.S., to put pressure on Aristide, cut it off illegally, totally illegally, uh, even though it had been approved. Uh, and uh, hence, uh, in many cases, sewage does mix with drinking water, especially if you go into areas like Cité Soleil, which is uh, essentially a floodplain. It was a, a city built on a floodplain. 
uh, Haiti's largest slum uh, in Port-au-Prince. And this um, uh, 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 bidonville, they call it, this slum, is basically flooded all the time because the garbage which flows down out of the capital ends up in the um, waterways that are supposed to flow into the ocean and they're totally clogged with mostly plastic bottles and, and, and styrofoam plates and so forth. And so you just have these, these mountains, this great clogging of plastic, which uh, ends up backing up all the sewage into Cité Soleil. So you have all these kids you know, playing and uh, people selling food alongside uh, just horrendous sewage and, and this means the cholera spreads. Uh, so they tried to eradicate it um, and it's cut down a lot, but you know, it, it sometimes surges, especially in periods like now when you have uh, a lot of um, uh, violence and people can't move, uh, tr trucks can't come in. When, when uh, Dan Cohen and myself went in November to Haiti, uh, you know, we couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't drive into Cité Soleil. We had to go on motorcycles, you know, with our legs up by our ears, our feet up by our ears to, to avoid the water, which, you know, we're going through uh, three, three foot deep rivers, basically, to, to get into Cité Soleil. So uh, the government has virtually no infrastructure to provide medical help to people. And Haiti is what you call the, uh, <laughs> the, the Republic of NGOs, they call it. Uh, and uh, there are some 3,000 NGOs based in Haiti. It has more NGOs per non-governmental organizations. Again, a great misnomer because almost all these non-governmental organizations are sponsored by some government, whether it's the US, the, Can the Canadians of theirs, the English of theirs, the French of theirs. Uh, but the uh, NGOs are the ones who sort of prey on the population. For many, it's a big business, especially the religious ones. You know, they go and, you know, help this children for only 10 cents a day. You see the ads on television. And, uh, you know, there's some pastors who make multi-million dollar uh, uh, salaries off the, the back of the contributions of uh, bleeding hearts in the U.S. who will send their money to support a Haitian kid. Okay, so the, the NGOs come in and they provide a very kind of patchwork um, uh, 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 clinics, uh, programs, which sometimes will last for three months or maybe three years. And um, so it's, it's a kind of hit and miss. Well, we visited one of these. Uh, helping Hands, uh, you know, they often have names like that, Helping Hands or of the, the, the hands of God or whatever it is. And uh, so these are the things that are, are the only bulwark against the spread of cholera. And as I say, it, it has since 2010 spiked and dropped, spiked and dropped. Um, it's not the crisis it was um, a decade ago where uh, you had uh, some 10,000 people who died uh, in, in, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands were, were sickened, but um, some uh, 10,000 people was, that was the, the figure that was often thrown out. It was surely much more than that because many people were not uh, uh, tallied up. But uh, yeah, the, the, the cholera epidemic remains uh, a lasting legacy, shall we say, of uh, the imperialist foreign military interventions of Haiti. Like, so, I mean, in these places, not just in Cité Soleil, but all other slums, so you don't have garbage collection. You don't have like uh, underground sewage or anything. So it's just everything getting dumped there. But the people- So that... Haley, I'll tell you just one picture because sometimes the concrete helps. There you see this giant clog of plastic blocking the sewage 
uh, canals exit into the ocean, where well, that's not much better anyway, but in the midst of it is a bulldozer or a sort of a steam shovel meant to clean it, which has been just abandoned there because it didn't have gas and just rusting away in the midst of these mounds of garbage. So this, this gives you a picture of what is happening uh, throughout Haiti. And instead of like, instead of investing money to in people's health, they're investing in police and guns and exactly. invasion, invasion. Yeah. So, and, and the United and just, Nations seems to be in the invasion. Oh, yeah, continue. Yeah, Please. and just to circle back on that. Yeah, this is mm -hmm. essentially the thing. The, the U.S. approach, and hence the U.N.'s approach, the U.N. being its handmaiden, is that we're going to solve this problem of violence, of insecurity, of gangs through guns. You know, we get bigger guns. Pretty soon they'll start to look like these, you know, American policemen who have as, as Fidel Castro once said, they look like Martians. You know, they have antennas and all kinds of goggles and shields, and you know, they 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 they're 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 extraterrestrials. Um, and that's not going to be the solution. It's you're never going to have a big enough gun or enough guns to even uh, 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 master that situation. It's only when the population is linked with the forces as they are at least temporarily now with the Bois Calais, where the police, the rank and file police, uh, at least because the brass is quite alarmed by this development, but the rank and file police are accompanied by these huge mass of people, many carrying machetes. Uh, and, and this is really the only way you can address uh, the um, insecurity. So yes, they're pumping money in for guns, you know, which of course helps the gun manufacturers and uh, so forth. But at the end of the day, yes, if they were investing in cleaning the canals, cleaning out the slums, uh, providing schools, hospitals, et cetera. And of course, these are the demands of the G9, of Jimmy Cherizier, is simply saying, you know, we need to live. We need internet, schools, roads, uh, uh, sewage canals, uh, internet, uh, uh, hospitals, clinics, etc. None of this is invested. In. And the UN also is on board with invasion as it has been since I was a child. So anyways, this year also in February, I think in late February, the UN new UN High Commissioner on Human Rights, Volker Turk, visited Haiti. And he, like, he went from CARICOM, or it happened after the CARICOM meeting, I think. So he visited that country and advocated for a multilateral force under a UN member state, but he did not say it would be under a United Nations Security Council mandate, but under a like, third party, something like that. So his proposal was very similar to what the US has been proposing. It even tried to propose it through Canada and unfortunately Mexico at the UNSC, but it did not. I think the proposal finally did not even come. but. Now the UN High Commissioner is making the same proposal of a multilateral force under a separate UN member state in Haiti, trying to control gun violence and gangs and everything. And his office has been like, either he or someone from his office, a representative has been going around the world and especially in third world countries, trying to get support for this humanitarian intervention as it, call, uh, as it is called everywhere. So is the UN not violating its own charter when it is, supporting a proposal like this and even advocating for a proposal like this? Yeah, well, I'll take the second part first, which is yes, it violates the UN Charter because as uh, Article um, 2 of uh, Chapter 7 says, uh, it's Paragraph 7 of, of the UN Charter, Article 2, chapter um, Paragraph 7 of the UN Charter says, and I'll quote, I happen to have it here. Nothing contained in the present charter shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state. The UN Security Council is only supposed to be used, according to the charter, to deal with questions of international peace and security. That is basically fights between states. That is, um, you know, if uh, uh, two states are fighting, let's say uh, India and Bangladesh, 
okay, now the UN could come in and be a buffer, but <laughs> not in internal matters. And worse than that is that they're not supposed to use uh, to be able to go deputize some country to come in and you know take over a country. Uh, that also is not in the charter. It's supposed to be a UN force, the UN peacekeeping force, which goes in controlled by the Security Council. What the US is trying to do through the Security Council, and so far China and Russia thankfully have blocked it, is to just deputize the country. Okay, Canada, you can go in, do what you will with Haiti, this, this country which can't rule itself. So uh, this is the, the, the approach. And uh, then, yes, the humanitarian crisis, again, it's all these sort of catchphrases, these watchwords they use, humanitarian catastrophe. Every uh, statement you see from, uh, in Haiti, they have uh, what's called the UN Office for Haiti. Uh, the, the very generic name. It's called the BINU in, in uh, uh, French. Is, that's what the acronym gives, BINU. And the BINU is uh, an office which has a, a, a leader. It was up until a few weeks ago, uh, uh, Helen Lalim, a State Department career officer. And every statement she would give to the Security Council would inevitably have the word, Haiti has a humanitarian catastrophe. Humanitarian catastrophe. So uh, people like Volker Turk and others are, are, are playing into this by promoting this idea of a humanitarian catastrophe that we have to go help these poor Haitians. And again, this is the whole thrust of the Global Fragility Act which is the US uh, project, which is fundamentally an offense against China to keep these countries falling like dominoes, as they used to call it back during the Vietnam era, uh, into the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, you know, countries, went, Dominican Republic, for instance, has uh, dropped its recognition of Taiwan to uh, go over to the People's Republic of China and uh, are receiving billions of dollars of aid from China to, for development. And Haiti has been offered by China. This was years ago. It's probably more now. But they were uh, three, four years ago, they were offered $4.7 billion to overhaul the infrastructure of Port-au-Prince, fix those clogged sewage canals, uh, put in electricity, put in roads, put in um, all the infrastructure you need for people to not be living in, in total squalor. And um, uh, of course, this has been blocked uh, by the US pressure. In fact, before his assassination, Jovenel Moise was summoned to Mar-a-Lago uh, by President Trump. And in addition, to telling Moise that he had to get on board with the US campaign against Venezuela, Trump told Moise, uh, you better not uh, drop Taiwan because we want you to keep Taiwan. Uh, I mean, this shows the power of the US security state, which even though, though it was having a lot of problems with Donald Trump, was having him do their bidding in the case of Haiti. So all of this is to say that, um, Yes, the uh, humanitarian catastrophe in Haiti, quote unquote, is the uh, big billboard they put on in front of this intervention push, uh, you know, where um, you've heard of the responsibility to protect uh, um, a doctrine, which is essentially been the um, uh, pretext for foreign military intervention in the third world for the past uh, 30 years. Yeah, like they're even not only for military intervention, like in case of Venezuela, the responsibility to protect has been used to justify the sanctions. Like yeah, right. They're protecting <laughs> people by, by sanctioning right. whatever they need. Yeah. So that's yeah. the sort of thing. And like in in case of Haiti, I also think that there is a push to legitimize any sort of intervention by trying to get 
support from the Caribbean states because like Trudeau went to CARICOM, like he was a special guest in the CARICOM summit in February itself. And he said he is going to dispatch two gunboats of the Royal Canadian Navy to Haiti. And he is also going to, I mean, I don't know if he has given the gunboats, but he seemed like, uh, he, like he got a lot of support in the CARICOM. And even in the CARICOM summit declaration, there was all this thing that Canada's prime minister had said, that he is going to control whatever is happening in Haiti, etc. And they were supporting it. So I don't know if Trudeau has sent the gunboats, you'll tell me. But apart from that, which is more important, the gunboats are only two, nothing. I mean, how much the Canadian government has invested in the Haitian police, like what things they give, what weapons, what uh, equipment, etc. Yes. Uh, okay. First off, um... The Canadians did send the gunboats, two of them, uh, the Halifax, and it's in Haiti Liberté. We we wrote about it uh, on a couple of occasions, and I should say we have a number of uh, Canadian contributors to uh, Haiti Liberté who are very helpful in uh, keeping track of Canadian imperialism's interests in Haiti, uh, which are primarily mining and banking. Uh, you know, these are the two big sectors of uh, Canadian capitalism that have interest in Haiti. Um, and uh, they flew a spy plane also over Haiti. Uh, you know, so, you know, I don't know what a spy plane is going to pick up. But so these are more sort of spectacle show uh, 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 efforts. To, to impress on people that, you know, we're, we're going to do it, we're getting ready, you know. But um, at the end of the day, they haven't put boots on the ground. And in March, uh, uh, President Joe Biden went up to meet with Justin Trudeau in Ottawa and put the full court press on him to, you know, actually send boots on the ground. And, and the Canadians said, no, we're not going to do that. I like to think that part of that is due to our intervention, Haiti Liberté's intervention at the United Nations on December 21st, where we said, listen, the 12 million people in Haiti and the 4 million people in its diaspora, they don't want intervention. They do not want it, and you better not do it. And uh, I think this has helped stay their hand because they're, they're a little leery to be the one. You know, historically in Haiti, Canada has always been the good cop. Uh, the U.S. and Canada are the two principal neo-colonial masters of Haiti. And uh, the U.S. has always been sort of a tough guy and the Canadians were the good guys. You know, eh? you know we're going to help you. Eh? But they have kind of switched roles now. They, they've made Canada be the bad cop. You're going to be the bad one. We're going to be the good cop, you know, lingering in the background. Um, but everybody knows it. As they, they have a saying in Creole, rat kone, chat kone. The rat knows and the cat knows. So uh, everybody understands exactly what's going on. And the Canadians basically don't want to get into it. And also, who's going to pay for it? So um, at the end of the day, uh, uh, the Canadians did not really have success with CARICOM. They were hoping they, they have Jamaica, uh, Andrew Holness. In fact, uh, Guterres was down there just last week, again, trying to push him to uh, front, be the deputy who would carry out the UN uh, sanctioned occupation. Um, Barbados agreed, and I think uh, was it Curacao? There was maybe one other, they, they got like three out of the 33, I think it is, is it 33 uh, in, in CARICOM? So, uh, so they haven't had great success. And uh, people like, uh, Gonzalez in, in um, uh, uh, the, the, the island, uh, St. Vincent, it, yeah, and Grenadines, uh, has been very vocal against it. So uh, this is good that uh, CARICOM stopped short of uh, uh, being the uh, front for the U.S. push. Uh, we can remember in Grenada in 1983, uh, you know, they... They had to cobble together a kind of a coalition of the willing of 10 countries. I think it was St. Lucia or maybe it was Barbados who 
fronted for that intervention of Grenada, which was, of course, just a U.S. intervention, uh, just like the intervention in Dominican Republic in 1965 was a U.S. intervention. That one had the fronting of the OAS. They couldn't get that in 1983, so they got this collection of Caribbean countries. So they might end up doing the same thing this time. If, if things really get bad and they have to send them in, they may just go with Jamaica, you know, as, as, as camouflage and Barbados. And, you know, maybe they can find one or two more and that'll be enough. And they'll just go in and say, well, we have this alliance, Caribbean, blah, blah, blah. So um, we're expecting that uh, that will be it. And of course, Canada will be part of the mix. So basically, <laughs> that was a long winded answer to say that uh, Canada has mostly just done head feints and, 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 and shows of force, but has not actually sent in a lot of force. Yes, there are trainers going in. They've had small groups. And I should just say, Saheli, that years ago, I remember I was in the Haitian countryside. And you know, when you're an American, uh, a lot of Haitians or Americans, uh, Haitian Americans too, will come up to you and say, hey, how you doing? You know, where are you from? Brooklyn. Okay, I'm from Brooklyn too. And I met this guy out, I think I was in Miraguan. And uh, I said, you know, what are you doing here? And he goes, oh, I'm with the uh, U.S. Army. And I said, no, oh, you're with the U.S. Army. No, what are you, on vacation? He goes, no, I'm working here. I go, you're working here? Yeah, you go, I'm kind of, I'm undercover or whatever. So, you know, that told me that, you know, they have covert operations where they have people planted in the country uh, at any given time. So, you know, uh, we can't... Uh, eliminate that as a possibility that there are a lot of troops sort of uh, being infiltrated in on, uh, uh, on some level. Uh, and do you think that in this, if, if the US manages to bring together a coalition of the will in so-called two, three countries, whatever, would Dominican Republic be also part of it? Like the president yeah. of Dominican Republic is saying that, like we need mm -hmm. intervention. You have a point there, but I don't think it will ever happen because the Dominican Republic and Haiti are, as they say in Creole, I know I'm sprinkling, sprinkling in a lot of Creole, let taxiton, that's milk and lemon, and the two don't mix. And uh, that's the one thing, this, even though Abinader, Luis Abinader, has been the principal uh, uh, cheerleader for foreign military intervention, saying, you know, they're sinking our country, they're sending all the Haitians over here. I mean, the Dominican Republic would not function without Haitian labor. I mean, everybody holding a shovel or a hammer or a, 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 a dust uh, rag in the hotels, uh, it's ha they're Haitian. You know, the, the cheap labor in Dominican Republic is carried out by Haitians. Uh, so uh, he, of course, just like the politicians in the U.S. use the invasion of the Haitians as uh, some sort of uh, a scapegoat, and um, but they would never send troops. I, 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 you know, this would hit a, a nerve in the Haitian psyche, and I don't think that would ever go across. So it would be like Barbados. Probably Jamaica. Jamaica is like, yeah. Keeps like getting support. Then I think. Yeah, Barbados, Jamaica. Yeah, the English-speaking Caribbean. Um, uh, you know, maybe Bahamas. Possibly Bahamas. You know, I mean, Bahamas is largely made up of Haitians. You know, many. I mean, Sydney Poitier, right? One of the most famous uh, Barbadians. What um, you have. Uh, it, you know, always an effort by the empire to put in people um, who resemble the, the victim of the intervention. And um, so the more uh, uh, predominantly Black nations that they can have front for the intervention, the better in their eyes. Yeah, like it's the image building of yeah. an image that these are 
very similar, but they're also wanting intervention. So it must be correct, et cetera. Exactly. Yeah. It's the same way they used Brazil in the in the 2004 oh, intervention, yeah. because Haitians adopted Brazil as their team, right, which was a largely uh, African team or African origin team, um, African ancestry team. And so, uh, you know, Haitians identified with it. So they said, oh, Brazil, you'd be perfect. And Lula, of course, took the bait, unfortunately. But um, hopefully he wouldn't do that again. I don't think he would. I, I can't imagine he would. Mm. I mean, I, I certainly hope he would. Yeah, I hope so, too. There were like other countries also. Like in that time, there was Ecuador, Argentina, and a lot of other countries initially supported that, I remember. But yeah. later they went away. But they had supported it, too, and hopefully... At the time, they had also like progressive governments. Now, except Ecuador, the others also have progressive governments. But I hope they won't do it again. I yeah, hope that's not that. No, Bolivia. I, 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 I had to at one point in time dress down the Bolivian ambassador, saying, uh, uh, "You know, what are your troops doing as part of Minista in Haiti?" And he said, "Well, that was before Evo came in." I said, well, "All the more reason you should pull out." You know. So, but anyway, he, uh, that's another chapter. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, is there a political solution for this crisis? So that's the big thing. Invasions would be done by foreigners, we know, but political solution should be coming from within. And now you have Ariel Henry, who is the prime minister, but nobody elected him. So, like, no, and it looks like nobody wants him either. But, like, are there other political forces within the country who have support within the ITM people. And like, if there is an election, I think the election has been delayed and delayed, but if there is an election ever, so would these uh, forces gain enough popular support to form uh, more like sort of progressive government, even if it might not be like Aristide? And like, I mean, what, what are the ways in which the people of the country can gain back the control of their country, either through election or through any other means? Okay, so just to give a very uh, brief thumbnail, I don't want to get too too into the weeds uh, with your audience, um, but uh, the U.S. just like in the U.S., we have a Republican Party and Democrat, but they're both you know within the framework uh, and controlled by the ruling class. Uh, in Haiti, it's a little bit the same thing. They have the Ariel Henry coalition, which was originally called the Musso coalition, is now is called the um, HCT, uh, uh, Haitian Commission for Transition. Um, and so that's one coalition, the Ariel Henry Coalition, which has as its head a former uh, uh, prime, uh, pr presidential candidate, uh, Mirland Maniga. Uh, that's sort of the, the, the portrait in front of that uh, 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 float. And the other one is the thing called the Montana Accord Coalition. And this is uh, as they say in French, the bourgeoisie éclairée, the enlightened bourgeoisie, which are, um, tend to be liberals. There's some sort of leftist groups involved with it. I mean, nominally leftist uh, who, you know, propose uh, sort of a socialist uh, alternative. Um, you um, had uh, briefly for a time, the Lavalache family party of Aristide was part of it. Uh, even though um, marginally, Lavalas has pulled out the, a lot of the leftist groups, one that was highly associated with Haiti Liberté. Uh, we quite disapproved from the beginning about the, the um, Montana Accord, but it, it's basically headed by people who spearheaded the 2004 coup d'etat and who have been sucking up to the Haitian State Department to try to get into power. Because for them, they have to get a nod from Washington to get into power. And in fact, they have a big faction of the uh, US security state of the State Department's uh, people. In particular, we can speak of a former special envoy to Haiti for the State Department, uh, Daniel Foote, who resigned after the uh, Del Rio debacle back in uh, 2021, or was it 22? 
Uh, and um, you had Susan Page, who wrote uh, as uh, uh, she was head of one of the UN missions, uh, the last armed chapter seven mission called uh, Mine Just. Uh, she wrote for the Council on Foreign Relations, I believe, that you know, we need to go with the Montana group, which is referred to through code as a Haitian-led alternative, Haitian-led. You know, this is, again, another one of these monikers, catchphrases. So they've been using Haitian-led with uh, the Montana group. And according to some of our sources, they're, they're starting to see that Ariel, much like Jovenel uh, Moise, has become unviable. Uh, that, you know, he's too uh, burdened. And just like they do with Republicans and, and Democrats, you know, they sort of alternate. So they're talking about switching over to the Montana behind the scenes. And so the Montana's uh, day may be coming. Uh, and they also are proposing holding elections. And now, can they do it? I very much doubt it. I really don't think it's going to change anything because they both fundamentally remain beholden to the U.S., to the State Department. And to me, the only way out of this uh, uh, diagonal, as they say in Haiti, uh, a diagonal or a box canyon, is a revolutionary solution. And this is what the G9 is proposing. They're saying we have to put the people in power. And um, as I, I said once, and, and Dan kind of picked it up and that's become one of our watchwords, basically Sherry Thier and the G9 are Aristide with a gun. And what Aristide was doing was saying, the people, tout moun se moun, everybody is a person. And we need to respect the poor and we need to uh, provide for them, they need a seat at the table, et cetera, et cetera, both politically, economically. And uh, uh, basically, Cherizier is Aristide with a gun. He's saying, not just we need to do this, Aristide was always saying, you know, love, I love my brothers, and let's do it with love, love, love. But Cherizier is saying, no, this has got to end. We, we're going to take this. You know, we, these guns you put in our hands to fight for you against each, uh, each other, we're not going to fight each other anymore. We're going to fight you. And this is, uh, to me, what the great potential for change is, is that, you know, the people uh, take power uh, in some way, uh, uh, by any means necessary, to uh, change this infernal situation where you have 90% of the population living in sewage, in slums with no schools, hospitals, roads, anything. And then you have this elite living in the mountains it, with helicopter pads in their house uh, and, and you know, swimming pools and uh, just incredible opulence. So um, Haiti, um, it, it can't go on like that. And I think in the new multipolar world where uh, the US power and hegemony is on the decline, uh, the possibilities for Haiti uh, to reclaim its sovereignty and reclaim its um, self-determination are, are, are very great. And it's like a two century war, I mean, Starting from the independence, it has been always like that. Like somebody comes in, invades, and imposes something, and it goes on and on. The cycle is repeating every time. So I hope something changes finally, and the US does not overthrow it again. Okay. So apart from what the people of IT can do, I mean, it's up to them. How can we, from outside, help and support the people? For example, in case of not just the cholera, but also in case of the general healthcare, like how can we provide supplies like medicine, equipment, etc. Like how to whom to contact in order to send these things, or like how to or whom to lobby so that they would not uh, 
invade or would be not forced to invade or would be forced to stay their hand as you said in case mm -hmm. of like i listened to your even as a uh, speech in december and of course we were like most of us won't be able to go to that position and we understand but each of us can do something from our own trenches so what is what can we do right well i i think in every trench basically people have to fight against foreign intervention in Haiti, let the people solve the problems themselves. And um, I think to the extent that people can support, whether it's on social media or in whatever uh, megaphones or uh, platforms, they have uh, the counter narrative to the gang violence. And I can say that Haiti Liberté uh, has tried to articulate that in its pages and in its uh, statements and interviews over the past uh, two years uh, for um, support of the Haitian people's movement. Um, uh, I think that will help. Uh, we we um, need to, to keep that sort of ideological front uh, strong. And so uh, like this interview with you, with Orinoco is, is Great, it's fantastic. And um, uh, of course, financial support always helps. Haiti Liberté is struggling as uh, any alternative media is. Uh, and I should say that we're not just a newspaper, but it's really a network of um, political organizers in the US, in Haiti, in Miami, uh, et cetera. And we um, carry out a lot of material support to Haiti. There's also the office where we're based, the uh, Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti, IJDH, and um, the Bureau des Avocats Internationaux, the BAI it's called, which is an office of uh, progressive human rights lawyers in Haiti. But there are a number of other uh, organizations, um, uh, legal uh, primarily, which uh, can be supported. So I would say um, seek them out. You know, we at Haiti Liberté are glad to receive any uh, requests or make references. And um, uh, I can I can say that 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 right now is the the principal things we can we can refer to. There's no real political force uh, yet. Uh, that uh, we can point to. I mean, uh, we think the G9 is uh, has potential of maybe eventually they're sanctioned now by the United Nations. Uh, so it's uh, difficult to provide any support to them, but um, at least maybe in the future, they will uh, emerge as uh, something which uh, has some ways to um, support them and to uh, carry on their struggle. Uh, but it, it, the long and short of it is that uh, if people um, reach out to us, we'll, we'll be able to direct them in any ways that they, they can um, uh, contribute. Okay, thanks a lot for that, because that is a big thing. Like we cannot do anything. It's a very like sort of feeling feeling one's hands tied, let's say. So, and uh, I mean, this is a country that has always been suffering. So it has to end, it has to end some way. Anyway, so how, I mean, apart from IT Liberté and your uh, articles in other places, where else to reach you? I mean, where to find your work on social media, et cetera. So where to find you and your stuff? Okay, my hashtag on Twitter is Kim Ives 13 uh, HaitiLiberté.com is our uh, principal um, website that the newspaper also distributes. And again, my um, email address is Kim at HaitiLiberté.com. People can also write to editor at HaitiLiberté.com to get to the uh, editorial office, but I'm the English language editor. So uh, for those speaking English, that's the way to reach us. And um, yeah, we look forward to hearing from you. And let Liberté is with an E on the end, not a Y. Yeah, yeah, I know it's like the French. <laughs> yes. So that's it. So thanks, thanks a lot for all this information. I mean, we could go on and on. I think we could talk about 
you did not want to go into the weeds of the political situation, but that's yeah. that could be for another day Part because two. I'm very I'm very interested I'm very interested to know what's happening in the political front because somehow one has to reach a political solution for it. It's not invasion will not solve anything. Everybody knows that, and somehow it has to change. Uh, so yeah, part two, we can wait for part two. It will be interesting. 